Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the pastor at Cross of Life, and we're so thankful that you clicked on this video. We really pray that it benefits you, it grows your faith, or maybe introduces you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced before. But what we also want for you is to be connected to a local congregation. So if Cross of Life is your home congregation, we're glad that you make use of these resources, but make sure that this never comes in the place of coming together for worship with the body of believers. Let's be a church that values in-person gathering when so much of life is digital. And if you're somebody who's not from Mississauga, uh, get in touch with the local church in your area. It can be so easy to pick and choose, oh, I like this preacher or I like this message, but never actually invest in the place that Jesus says that he is, in his body, the church. And we encourage you to take time to put yourself into his body, in a local congregation, so that you can pray for one another, love one another, support one another, forgive one another, do all the things that the scripture talks about for one another. So we hope you're blessed by this video, and we hope that we get the chance to see you in person sometime soon. The text we're looking at is the first 12 verses of Galatians. I'll read the text for us. Paul, an apostle sent not from man, nor by a man, but by Christ Jesus and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you had accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is God's word. And we're starting a new series, as you can tell, on the book of Galatians. We're calling this series The Gospel uh, because the book of Galatians is obsessed with the message of the gospel. Like, by density, there is no book in the Bible that speaks about the gospel more than Galatians. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks through our summer going through this book of Galatians and seeing it for the beautiful picture of the gospel that it is. Some theologians have talked about the gospel kind of like a diamond. Like you can hold a diamond, but depending on what direction you hold it, the light refracts differently within the diamond and it looks different and beautiful, and yet it's always the same diamond. The gospel is similar. The gospel never changes. And yet, as we look at it from different angles, we see different angles of beauty that the gospel gives us. And so that's what we're going to study for the next number of weeks in the book of Galatians. Uh, But one thing I want to draw your attention to before we get into the teaching for today is that little tagline up there. It might be too small for you to see if you're in the building uh, here today, but it says, the gospel, if it sounds too good to be true, you're starting to get it. Maybe you heard this. I know my, my dad told me this when I was growing up. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It's not true with the gospel. If it sounds too good to be true, you're starting to get it. The gospel is the most amazing message, the most blow-your-hair-back, life-altering message you have ever heard. As Paul said in the text, it's not from human origin. You never would have thought it up, and frankly, it's going to be hard to believe. But if you start to think, man, that sounds too good to be true, you're in a little way starting to get it, which is really good news, because if you're anything like me, you need something that this world can't offer you. The world is giving you all sorts of answers that will not suffice. You need something bigger, something transcendent, something beyond you and every person around you, and that's what the gospel offers. So let's dig in. We're starting at the beginning because, well, that seems like a good place to start. It's where Paul started with the first couple verses. But before we get into those verses, I want to give you a little bit of context so you understand the content. Uh, the region of Galatia is just north of Jerusalem. If you look at this map, this is the Mediterranean Sea. You know that Jerusalem is on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Galatia is uh, what we might think of as a province. It's not a single city. Um, it's an area with a number of cities in it. 
We find out in Acts 14 that the Apostle Paul went to Galatia and planted a number of churches in this region. You can read about them. And then he comes back to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council, which we hear about in Acts 15. Uh, But it turns out that in that time when he had come back to Jerusalem, uh, there was some false teaching that had arisen among the Galatian churches. And we'll talk about exactly what that false teaching is when we get there. But the point for you to see now is how much Paul cares about this. Uh, Paul writes a letter to all these churches in Galatia, which you saw the intensity with which he uh, wrote at the beginning of this reading. And then he will actually trek all the way back to Galatia himself to correct these things in person. And to give you some scale for this, uh, the trip from Jerusalem to the province of Galatia would be like walking from here to Thunder Bay and there's a mountain range that you have to cross to get through there. Uh, This is a significant trip, but Paul cares so deeply about this issue that he's willing to not just write this strongly worded letter, but also to travel there himself to correct the issues that are happening in the congregation. And you can start to see some of the intensity just in these first couple words. Uh, You saw that the Apostle Paul, when he started, gave a typical Greek letter greeting. He said, it's from me, Paul, it's to you, churches in Galatia, But then he did something very different. Uh, If you look at at Paul's other letters, for example, the letter to the Colossians, after he addresses the letter, says, it's me, Paul, writing to you in the church of Colossae, he makes these kind of flowery, we might call like letter small talk statements. We always thank God for you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, and he waxes eloquent for a few more verses because he loves the Colossians. But in Galatia, No such flowery small talk. I mean, you can imagine this. If you get an email, uh, you you kind of expect this to happen. Like, dear John, how's it going? Hope all is well in Toronto. How are the kids? You expect this sort of thing, but when you get that email that's like, dear John, and then they launch into whatever they want to talk about, you you understand the intensity. It's exactly what Paul does, right? Paul, to the churches in Galatia, I am astonished. Uh, In Greek, this is even more dramatic. It's only one word in Greek, three words in English. And it's a word that is uh, used in other letters, not biblical letters, to show just extreme disappointment. (laughs) Like like that kind of thing you do with your kids when they they don't do what you want them to do and you don't really want to yell at them and you just say, I'm disappointed in you. Like that's this word. I am astonished. What is he astonished about? Well, you can see He's astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Just to highlight a couple phrases in these first couple of verses, he says that he's astonished that they are deserting the one who called them to live in the grace of Christ, following a thing that is no gospel at all. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the false teaching that you're believing, Galatians, is leading you away from Christ. It's robbing you of the peace of living in the grace of Christ. It's no gospel at all. It can't save you. It's not sufficient. And I'm astonished because I taught you the pure gospel. You know what it is. And yet now you're turning to something else that's no gospel at all. Paul's serious. He continues only a verse later by saying that if anyone, even an angel from heaven, should preach a different gospel, they should be under God's curse. Literally, the word in Greek is anathema. Maybe you've heard that word before. It's translated in other places, let them be damned. This is serious language, which, if you're taking notes with us, is the first fill in the blank. From Paul's perspective, false teaching is serious. It's serious business. I think that's hard for for some of us to hear, uh, because in our world where there are so many different denominations of Christianity, we can start to think to ourselves, well, either all these little differences between the different denominations don't matter, or there's no way you could possibly unravel all of them. But the scripture won't let us think that way. It will say, if there is false teaching, it is serious business because false teaching robs you of Christ. Which is why we call out false teaching when we see it, even in other church bodies. Because unfortunately, if you look at official teachings from other denominations, you will see that what they teach on paper robs them of the gospel. It's not that they don't open their Bibles. It's not that they don't think they're preaching the gospel, but they rob their people of the gospel. 
Now, before you jump to conclusions, understand that by God's grace, a lot of people are ignorant of what their church officially teaches. In fact, I bet some of you are ignorant of what our church officially teaches. And so they can be saved in spite of their church body. But the point is to say, when we see false teaching, we call it out because it's serious business. It robs you of Christ. Which should make us think about ourselves a little bit. I mean, it's one thing to to call out false teaching in in other church bodies, but what about us? Like, do we look at our, our understanding of Scripture and realize how serious it is that we know the truth of the gospel? Uh, recently, I've been getting into some space age documentaries. I was watching this, uh, this series about uh, the United States getting to be the first people on the moon, and then um, some stuff with Elon Musk and SpaceX, and it's all really interesting to me. Uh, but one thing that just struck me is how much time it takes to prepare to go to space. Like, it's years. And even on the day when they're, they're going to actually go to space, they have to spend like hours and hours on pre-check and check and recheck and all these things because there are millions of dollars and human lives on the line. What if we had the same attitude about the gospel? What if we pre-checked and checked and rechecked? Because we realize that when it comes to the gospel, it's maybe not millions of dollars that are on the line, but it is human souls that are on the line that we would care deeply about what the scripture has to say because false teaching is serious and can rob you of Christ. This isn't like getting a passing grade on a test. Like you can't get 70% of the gospel and be saved. You need 100% gospel. You can't miss a bit. And so we see that false teaching is serious. But then we learn something else about false teaching. In that same verse, Paul says that they are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. This phrase, a different gospel, is just fascinating to me because you think of the other things that Paul could have said. He could have said, you're turning to a false teaching. You're turning to a satanic lie. But he says, you're turning to a different gospel. Which means Paul admits that in many ways, the teaching that they are listening to smells and sounds and looks like the gospel. Maybe you can think about it like AI. Have you interacted with some of these uh, AI language models online like ChatGPT? Or or maybe you've seen in some news reports or documentaries like AI robots. Um, They sound like, maybe even look like human beings. But you know as well as I know they aren't because they lack the essential quality of actually being human. In some way, Paul is saying the same thing about the message that the Galatians are believing. This sounds like the gospel. This looks like the gospel. This may even smell like the gospel. But it's not the gospel. It's something so slightly different that you may not even have noticed it when it happened. Which leads us to our second fill in the blank, if you're taking notes with us. False teaching is not just serious, but it's also subtle. It's subtle. You know, as you read the commentators on the book of Galatians, they'll say some things that are really interesting. Um, One of them will be that I think many people have the perception, maybe when they come to the book of Galatians, that the false teachers are people who are trying to destroy the gospel. Like they are coming in with malicious intent to make sure that these people stop believing in Jesus. The commentators will say that's probably not the case. These are actually probably the people that Paul had set up to be the elders, the leaders, the pastors of these congregations. And they were deceived. They thought they were teaching the truth, but they had believed a lie. What about us? Could it be that we think to ourselves, we have the gospel, we know the teachings, our doctrine is pure, but we believed a subtle lie? Could it happen that I, with all of my good intentions to teach you the truth of God's word, could be deceived by a lie and every Sunday you sit here and you take it? It's very possible which should teach us a couple things. First of all, it should teach us that an open Bible when we're studying together is a big deal. That you would make sure that I'm telling you the truth because as much as I want to teach you the truth, I am just as fallible as anybody else. I'm just as deceivable as anybody else. And that we should have a whole lot of compassion when we deal with all those other denominations we were talking about who maybe teach falsely. You know, I've met a lot of people who are not Lutheran, And uh, one thing I've learned is that every single one of them wants to be right. They desire to get it right. They're not trying to be wrong. It's just that false teaching is subtle. And so as we talk to our Roman Catholic or our Baptist or our Presbyterian or charismatic friends, like let's understand that they want to be right. They want to get Jesus right, but false teaching is subtle. 
And a humility that first sees ourselves as potentially susceptible to that kind of false teaching will also show compassion to others who have been deceived by false teaching. False teaching is serious and subtle, and we need to hold these, two, hold these two things in tension if we are going to properly understand what's happening in Galatia. Now, you're probably wondering to yourself, okay, well, what is the thing? What is the subtle misteaching that was being taught in Galatia? And, well, we'll get there. Uh, the, the text says that evidently some people, which is Paul like being super passive aggressive, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. This word pervert is a really good word. Um, to give it just a little bit more color, though, it's a word that means something like reverse. So what he's doing is he's taking the essential elements of the gospel. He's not changing anything in substance, but he's reordering things so that it doesn't come out the same way. Any of you who have ever done baking, you know this, right? You can put the ingredients in, but if you don't put them in in the right order, like, things can get messed up. The same thing is happening here. It smells like the gospel, sounds like the gospel, looks like the gospel. The things are just slightly out of order. So what was this slightly out of order? It was Jesus and. Jesus and. You can have your Jesus. I mean, he saved you. He died on the cross. He forgave all of your sins. He resurrected so that you could live forever. And you need to do this. Again, I think the, the thing that we sort of, I guess, assume about the Galatians is that these false teachers were coming in and they were saying, yeah, Jesus, but like Jesus got you started, but you need to do a whole lot of things to make sure you earn the rest of your salvation. I actually don't think that's what they were doing. I think they were preaching the pure gospel and then adding something on the end. Jesus is your savior. Jesus is all you need. Jesus has risen. Jesus is coming again. And and, and, and. What, well, what are those ands? I think there's two ways that we can see it in the text. And I'm synthesizing the rest of the book of Galatians for you. We'll get there. But just to set the stage for you, these are the two things that I see the and being. First of all, it's Jesus and salvific good works. Not so much that, that you need these works in order to be saved, but you need these good works in order to stay saved. Do you understand the, the distinction? Like Jesus gets you there. He gives you everything that you need. He, he baptizes you into his family. He forgives all your sins. He gives you his righteousness. But now you got to stay in. You got to make sure that you're producing good works. You need to make sure that you're remaining faithful. Uh, just in case you think this doesn't really happen, a very famous pastor who just recently died, if you know who that is, good for you. I was listening to one of his sermons and he said, the way you know you're a Christian is you're producing the fruit of the spirit. You know what that is? Jesus and. The way you know you're a Christian is if you're a good person. But I think even more subtle than this is Jesus and religious works. I think this maybe is even more in focus with the, the Galatians. This is what they were really struggling with. And I think to understand this, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a Galatian. So you've been following your pagan gods, your pagan deities and worship life. You've been making your sacrifices, going to the temple. And all of a sudden, this guy, Paul, shows up and he says, guess what? God came to earth and he died so that all of your sins are forgiven. He rose against so that you live forever and now you don't have to. The gospel is that you are free. And you're like, awesome. Because I have been weighed down by the guilt of my inability to be good enough and my inability to, to make up for the bad things that I've done. And so if there is a savior who can save me from all that, I am all in. And you are there on Sunday and you are clapping and you're happy. And then Monday comes. And then what? You're not going back to the temple. You're not going to the sacrifices. You're not praying to the pagan deity. You suppose you're going to go back on Sunday because they said they're meeting next Sunday. But what are you going to do in between? It was really kind of awkward for these new Christians because they didn't have a set up religious life to live which made them completely unique from every other world religion. Every other religion said daily sacrifices and prayers and meditations and all these things that you had to do. And the Christian gospel was, you don't have to. So what are you going to do now? And it seems to be this is what the Galatians are struggling with. The teachers came in and they said, well, yeah, the gospel is you're completely free. You don't have to. So now what you might as well do is go back to the old covenant because there's structure. There's something to do. Follow the sacrifices, follow the prayers, follow the festivals. It's religious activity. And you might think to yourself, okay, that doesn't sound all that bad, especially if they're not doing it to be saved, but, but let me press you on this. This is not what God saved us for. 
Christianity uniquely says that being part of the religion means you are externally focused. That's unique. Every other religion says the way to be religious in our religious system is to do more religious things. Be more dedicated to the text of whatever your holy book is. Be more dedicated to the worship life of your community. Be more dedicated to, well, whatever their little way of being worshipful is. But not Christianity. Christianity says, actually, the way to be a Christian is to do less religious things and more good for your neighbor. Because here's the truth. If God wanted the best thing for you right now, he would take you to be in heaven. Right? Like, there's no reason for you to stay here unless, of course, you can be good to your neighbor. And that's what God is doing. He's restoring the Garden of Eden. He's restoring this beautiful, self-sacrificial community that was existing in perfection but was broken because of Satan's lies that we believed. And in a little way, when he saves each individual Christian, he makes them a small piece of that puzzle being put back together. So let me make this personal for you. What does it mean to be a Christian? Does it mean make sure you go to church every Sunday? Does it mean make sure you're praying at home? Does it mean make sure you study your Bible? Those are all good things, but they're not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to be generously and self-sacrificially loving your neighbor because you've been fully loved in Christ. Because everything that you need in Christ, you have already been freely given. You are free now to give everything that you have to somebody else. To maybe think about this differently. Have you ever been to the gym and seen some of these guys who are just absolutely jacked? Like they're in the gym like 12 days a week. They're lifting three times a day. Sometimes I wonder about those guys. I mean, I realize probably some of them are athletes and maybe some of them are bodybuilders, but I really think there's a handful of them that do that just so they can look at themselves in the mirror. Sometimes I wonder if Christians are just like that. Like we're here strengthening our spiritual muscles, studying our Bibles, praying our Psalms regularly in worship so that we can look ourselves in the spiritual mirror. Rather than taking the strength that God gives us from his Holy Spirit in the scriptures for the love of our neighbor. We miss the point. And I think maybe if we can get personal, like Lutherans might be the ones who struggle the most at this. Like I think our understanding of scripture and doctrine is impeccable. That's why I'm a Lutheran. I also think our ability to take that impeccable doctrine and bring it to other people is very often dismal. We have the best message. We have the most pure gospel. And very often we just look ourselves in the spiritual mirror and smile. See, Jesus and doesn't have to be this very obvious, oh, well, I think I'm saved because I did good works. No, this Jesus and idea can be, well, I'm a Christian and I'm showing it, I'm being it because of all these things that I do that I can check boxes on. Rather than saying, well, what is the gospel? It's that I'm free. I'm free to not care about myself anymore. I'm free to use everything that I am and everything that I have for the good of other people. Which brings us to the third point, if you're taking notes with us, it's the challenge of this. You know, it's interesting to me that in verse 10, Paul says, am, am I trying to win the approval of human beings? Am I trying to please people? It's as if Paul anticipates that the people might be thinking to themselves, Paul, this message is not going to work. It is not going to work. It's not pragmatic. If you tell people that they are completely free in the gospel, you know what they're going to go do? They're going to go live for themselves. And very often, frankly, that is what happens. The sinful heart hears the gospel and twists it to its own devices to say, I'm good, so I can do whatever I want. But that's not why God gave us the gospel. God freed us so that we can love our neighbor. And this is challenging for us because, first of all, the gospel means that your sins are paid for. And that's hard to believe. You ever had this conversation with somebody where they say, "Um, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself? It's hard to believe. With all due respect, and I understand there's a lot of emotion that goes into saying something like that, um, who do you think you are? Like God forgives you. You think you can hold back forgiveness when God won't? But it's hard for us to believe because if we're able to hold on to our sin in a small little way, we can self-pity, we can self-deprecate, we can get attention from our sin rather than letting it be completely free. And maybe more dangerous for our our egos, your good works don't matter. 
You know, I have been a Christian for my nearly entire life, and I have been in church nearly every single Sunday of that 33-year life. I have generously been giving my offerings. I've spent the last 22 years scholarly studying the scriptures so that I can pro proclaim them to God's people. I have not cheated on my wife. I have tried to raise my children as Christians. I have done my best to love my neighbor. And you know how much God counts that for? Nothing. <laughs> I am no better, no more valuable, no more needed to the church than any of you because my good works don't count for anything. But you know what they have done? They benefited other people. God sees me and, and he loves me the same today as he did on my baptism day. But a whole lot of people have been benefited because of God's work through me. And the same is true for you. Like how many times you come to church, how many times you pray, how many times you open your Bible, how much you give in the offering plate, like God doesn't care. But it does benefit other people. And I think this is hard for us because we want to take some credit. We want to compare ourselves to what we were last year or last decade or our neighbor or this person that we sit next to in church, whatever. We want to compare ourselves and say, well, I'm a little bit better. I'm a little bit more valuable. It's God's work. It's not yours. It's not about you. It doesn't depend on you. You're free. You're free to add on to what God is already doing. And it's challenging for us because everything else in our life is performance-based. You have to be good enough looking or funny enough or engaging enough to find that person who's going to marry you. You have to work hard enough at your job to advance or get a raise or be better. You have to put in the hard work to lose weight or gain muscle or to look more beautiful in whatever way you deem is, is most important to you. Like you have to work every single thing except this. This is freely given to you. 100% not your work, Christ's work for you. You're free. It, you don't have to. Which is really the message of the last point, if you're filling in blanks with us. The hope of the gospel is the challenge of the gospel, but just said with a smile on your face. Like, like that is all very frustrating to us until we realize how glorious it is. Like, I don't have to forgive myself because God forgave me. If I don't forgive myself, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care if you forgive yourself because he forgives you. In all of your good works that you piled up, God already thought you were awesome. Why do you need those things? I mean, you have all of the love and affection and, and admi admiration and acceptance and inclusion that you have ever wanted in Christ. You don't have to earn any of it. And only this will power your life properly. The way that Paul says it is that this message was not taught to him. Which is really interesting to me, because I love to teach things. <laughs> Paul says this is not about getting the words all in the right order. It is about the overwhelming sense that God is real, and God has died, and God has risen for you, and that is the end. It is finished. I don't know that I can put the words together in a more convincing way to get that message across to you. You just got to believe it. At some point, I can't teach it to you. It's anti-logical in some sense but I believe the Holy Spirit can work it in every one of your hearts. So let's move on to the last bit, what I want to finish with today. Maybe you guys did this in, uh, in grade school. You did this experiment where you plugged a light into some potatoes and you found out that potatoes actually can produce an electric charge that can light up a small light bulb. Maybe none of you did this, but if you did, it's really a cool thing. It's amazing that God created the world to work in this way. Um, I'll, I'll hazard a guess though, that none of you are charging your phone at night on potatoes, right? If you are, don't raise your hand. Why? Because I think we all have a sense, even if we've never done this experiment, that potatoes don't have enough charge to do the things that we really want them to do to function in our lives. And yet, how much do we do this with our spiritual life? We plug ourselves into things that are insufficient to power our life. We think that if only... I do this, or if only I get that, or if only people say this about me, if only I'm acknowledged in this way, if only I make this much, if only I can find that special someone, then I'll be okay. But every one of those things is insufficient. People die, people are capricious, people disappoint you. The job only lasts until you can't do it anymore. The money is only good until the economy crashes. All of it will fail you, except the gospel. 
And if you plug your life into the gospel, you will find a freedom and a power and a peace that no other thing on this earth can offer you. So if you're taking notes with us, this is the big idea. This is what I want you to walk away from this service with. This is what I want you to remember. This is what I want you to say to somebody who asks you, what did you learn in church today? Stop plugging your life into a potato. Stop it. You have the greatest power source that exists on planet Earth. The unending, unconditional, never stopped, never stopping love of Christ. That whether you are a failure or a success, whether you are pulling it off or you are backsliding, whether you are enough or you are shortcoming all the time, whether people look at you and say, that's somebody I want to be like, or people look at you and say, I hope my kids never turn out like that. You have the love of Christ. You have the gospel. You are free. You don't have to. You don't have to let plug your life into a potato. So let's pray. Because the only way any of us are going to understand this is if God makes it real to us. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to bring that into our hearts. Jesus, Paul says that he wasn't even taught the gospel, which means that in some sense, everything that I just did is useless without your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would come today, that he would do his work of helping us to believe this unbelievable message that no matter how much we failed or how little we can pull off, we're still loved and accepted and admired in you. Make this not only real so that we have a peace that passes understanding, but that we are a light to our community, that we can love in a way like no one else can love, so that the gospel can continue to spread, not just from this room, but into this whole city. We ask that in your name. Amen.